Hello, hello. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. If you're in the Middle East, Far East, good evening or good night. Uh, give me a few minutes, let me set this up, please. If you're on GMT, good evening. And if you're in the, uh, American time, or what do they call it, Western or Eastern time, good morning, good afternoon. Um, today's Facebook Live is going to be mostly Gambian, with a little bit of African, Pan-African uh, talk, information, uh, talking about the developments in Mali, Burkina Faso, ECOWAS, and how this is impacting on African politics in, generally, in general. Uh, thank you very much for tuning in. Uh, if you give me a few minutes, let me set this up properly, please. Thank you. So I'm doing Facebook Live now on YouTube because Facebook is obviously restricting my account. Facebook doesn't want to hear the truth. Uh, I don't know whether it's the FBI that's telling them not to release my account or is the CIA. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Welcome. Welcome to this uh, Facebook Live, guys. My compatriots, my comrades. Sorry, I'm coming. Give me one second. I'm just setting this up. I'm ready. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Lamin Tamba. I am Gambian. If you're tuning in for the first time, as I often do, I introduce myself to my live videos. I'm switching from Facebook Lives, from my page at Mr. Lamin Tamba, to face YouTube, because Facebook obviously has decided that my Pan-African messages are not for them. Uh, Facebook has decided that uh, I cannot criticize France, I cannot criticize the West, uh, despite the fact that the problems that Africa is facing right now have got a lot to do with what the Western world is doing to African people. Uh, we have our own problems as Africans, but uh, for me as an individual, I believe if we are left to ourselves, to look after ourselves, to administer ourselves, we wouldn't be in such problem as we are right now because most of Africa's problems uh, are imported, all right? We don't help ourselves because we contribute to some of our problems as well. But a lot of what's going on in Africa right now 
has got something to do with the African people themselves. So my name is Lamin Tamba. I'll explain my political affiliation. I'll explain my uh, reasons for supporting the political party that I support in the Republic of the Gambia. I'll give you an idea of why we're having problems in Africa continuously with endless overthrows, especially West Africa. I'll come to that because right now, most of the coup d'etats that are taking place in Africa are all, almost 100% in West Africa. And that's the reason for it. Uh, part of the reasons uh, would be ourselves. The majority of the reasons have got some, nothing to do with ourselves. All right. So therefore, I am coming here to help my African brothers and my West African brothers in particular. We have problems across board in the whole of Africa. And the problems we have are very common. Some of the problems we have, we shouldn't be having right now in 2022. Uh, most of the world or the other regions of the world, the other continents have overcome some of these issues. We seem to be stuck uh, in, in terms of where we are now as a continent. It's Africa where you have these repeated problems. We can't seem to overcome some of these issues that we're going through. And that's because we're not prepared to sacrifice at least for one generation in our existence so that our children generations after us can benefit from some of the things that are, uh, we put or implement in our African continent. So now, I'm going to start with the Gambia, the Republic of the Gambia. Obviously, I'll start with the Gambia and then I'll end up with a view of West Africa in general so that you can see what's going on in West Africa. Um, West Africa is undergoing several overthrows and that's down to certain things which I'll discuss in the long way. But in the Gambia, especially where I'm going to start this conversation. The Republic of the Gambia has got serious problems, problems that we never experienced before. And these problems are down to leadership, 100% down to leadership. All right. Uh, and I'll elaborate on those ones. We most, most of us know. Some people don't know. I th believe some of the issues affecting Gambian people is because they haven't seen anything better uh, in terms of what's happening outside of the world. They haven't seen how quickly the world is developing compared to the Republic of the Gambia. So a lot of things that we're telling Gambian people, some of us who've traveled to the diaspora, some of us who've seen what's happening outside of the Gambia, when we tell Gambian people, hang on, we can do much better than this. What we're being issued or what we're being offered by Adam Abaro it's definitely not the best that Adam Barrow and his government can offer us. When Barrow came to power in 2017, he came with a lot of goodwill. The amount of money that's been pumped on Adam Barrow's government, President Jammeh didn't have it in his entire 22 years. And yes, the European Union said that the amount of money they gave to Barrow government in the space of three years they never gave that amount of money to President James 20 years as a civilian president. And that's true. That's absolutely true. It was Barrow government's pronouncements when they came in newly, they were announcing every single thing that was given to them. Because at the time they thought, all right, let's be transparent, let's be open, let's tell Gambian people how much money the European Union, the World Bank, the IMF, the African Development Bank, the Arab Development Bank, all the money, what the Chinese investors or Chinese government was pumping on the Adam Barrow government, they were publishing it. Those were the first days when Adam Barrow came to power. His government was trying their level best to publish. Oh, the World Bank just gave us $75 million. Oh, uh, the European Union gave us 370 million euros. Oh, the Saudi bank or the Arab bank, development bank, gave us 50 million euros. Oh, the IMF gave us 110 million euros. And these are sums that they were given. Oh, the Organization of Islamic Conference gave us $93 million to be able to establish facilities to host the conference in 2019. The conference never happened in 2019, never happened in 2020, never happened in 2021 never happened in 2022 and it will not happen in 2022 but i'll get there 
So the problems we have with the Republic of the Gambia right now is leadership. Even Barrow's supporters know. They're admitting now that Gambia is uh, basically vacant in terms of leadership. We do not have a proper president. We do not have a president who's advised by proper people, patriotic Gambians, Gambians who want to see development in our republic. What we have in the Gambia right now is a group of people who surrounded the president. This group of people, half of them know what the Republic of the Gambia needs. Half of them have got knowledge, academic knowledge. Half of them have got experience of working for international agencies, working for Gambia government departments. But this group of people are bent on advising the current so-called president of the Republic of the Gambia wrongly. So who's at the helm in the Gambia? Who's our president? The president we have in the Gambia now, if you're tuning in to Facebook Lives for the first time, if you're not familiar with Gambian politics, we have somebody who has a title of president. He is anything but a president. The person we have right now is called Adam Abaro. He came to power in January 20, 20, 2017 in unceremonious circumstances because there were issues, election challenges in the Gambia, and then the coup d'etat took place. And that coup d'etat will come to my Pan-African talk later on because these coup d'etats that are taking place in Africa are being facilitated by the economic community of West African states. And I'll discuss that later. So if you want to know what's happening in West Africa now with endless overthrows of governments, endless political turmoil, I will discuss these things later on. Yeah? All right? So I'll discuss them later on my program today. And I'll talk about the Kenyan president, William Ruto. I'll talk about the South African president, Cyril Ramaphosa, the problems he's going through, the problems that South Africa is going through. Uh, if I get the time... I'll talk about other issues that are affecting Africa and how the world basically doesn't care about the 14 life wars that are taking place in Africa. But let's go back to the Republic of the Gambia. What's happening in Gambia? We start with sectors, sector by sector. Now, we have seen Gambia suffer. I'll start with the Ministry of Interior, the crime rate, current, the crime rate and everything else that's happening in the Gambia. All right? So we start with because that's, that's where the life and death situation is. Gambians are murdering each other every single day in broad daylight. And the Gambia police force either cannot tackle crime rates, don't want to tackle crime rates, or a combination of the two. Now, Gambia police force is an institution. They can only tackle crime rate based on the facilities they have, based on the willingness based on the manpower that's available in terms of them tackling crime rates, all right? So now, why is crime rate rampant in the Republic of the Gambia? Many factors. I will start with one. One is because everybody in the Republic of the Gambia has seen the lack of, lack of uh, desire from Barrow government, the president himself, the so-called president himself, Adam Barrow. Gambian citizens have seen the lack of desire from him to tackle crime. And this crime, we're talking about low level or street crime. But the crimes that are happening in the Gambia are starting from Adam Barrow's office itself, the president's office, or office of the president as they call it in the Republic of the Gambia. That's where crime rate is starting. All right? So now, since Adam Barrow came to power, despite widespread corruption, Daylight robbery, rampant corruption in his government, including Barrow himself. Because when Adam Barrow came to power in 2017, this is a guy who was really poor, very poor, looked rough, unkempt. His clothes, most of the time, looked like he never bothered to iron them. All right? I'm not uh, basically belittling him or ridiculing him. That's why he looked like the photos that we saw of Adam Barrow before he became a presidential candidate when he became a presidential candidate and when he become became a president all right he was basically a low-level estate agent or letting agent that's what he was he was not even an estate agent he was a letting agent low level in the republic of the gambia before that he didn't have any any glorious jobs all right 
before that, he went to Germany to hustle as an illegal immigrant. He got deported. He came to England to hustle as an illegal immigrant, allegedly, and he got deported back to the Republic of the Gambia. He went back to the Gambia. He became a letting agent or a retail uh, agent or a middleman between landlords and tenants. Whatever the right title for him was, he was not wealthy when he came to power. He didn't have any experience in working in a uh, in an organized institution like the civil service for a long time. He worked for a private company before. The private company was owned by his uncle or his relative. All right, That's what Adam Abaro was before he became the president of the Republic of the Gambia. So now, when he became a presidential candidate, I listened to two of his interviews. I said, no. At that time, I was of the belief that a lot of fake stories, a lot of information that was being spread against President Jame and the APRC government were true because I was not in Gambian politics before January 20, sorry, December 2016. So the time I joined Gambian politics, at that point, President Jame was pronounced as the loser in the 2016 presidential elections in the Gambia. President Jame appealed against the election results. So the election petition was supposed to go to the Supreme Court of the Republic of the Gambia. That's what was supposed to happen. President Jame appealed and rightfully the Supreme Court should have convened and investigated his election petition and found out whether the election was actually rigged or the election was fair. The election was not free. And the word fair is in quotation marks as well because the election results changed about twice or three times in 2016, in December 2016 when the election took place. So owing to the, the uh, swing of votes, massive swing of votes from the opposition to President Jame, President Jame to GDC, GDC to the coalition party, coalition of Adam Abaro, President Jame appealed to the Supreme Court and said, look, hang on, we believe that there's widespread rigging of the elections in 2016. So I appealed. The Supreme Court couldn't sit and hear his petition. Many reasons were given for that. We believe the reasons were because the judges who were supposed to sit were intimidated. The dark forces, the foreign forces who've always plagued the African uh, politics didn't want President Jame to go to Supreme Court because there was merit to his election petition and he might have won the appeal, which meant the votes would have had to be counted fresh or the elections would have been held fresh. It depends on what ruling the Supreme Court would have made on the uh, election petition in 2016 December to 2017 January. So by January 2017, I was trying, I was already figuring out what was going on in Gambian politics, and I joined Gambian politics. Uh, and in March 2017, I joined the APRC, the Alliance for Patriotic Reorientation and Construction, which is the party I support till this day. That party was President Jame's party, it's still his party because he's the party leader of APRC, even though he's uh, residing in Equatorial Guinea right now. So, Adam Barrow came in, in unceremonious circumstances, he was sworn in on Senegalese soil illegally, because there's no provision in the Gambian constitution that stated that uh, an incoming president of the Republic of the Gambia can be sworn in, or a serving president of the Republic of the Gambia can be sworn into office on foreign land. So that swearing into office was an illegal swearing in. That's what happened in 2017. Either way, Adam Abaro became the president of the Gambia because ECOWAS, instead of pushing for the election petition of 2016 to go ahead to Supreme Court, because most of the Gambian judges are from ECOWAS and Commonwealth countries. This is where ECOWAS will become important somewhere down the line when I talk about Pan-Africanism and what's encouraging the current level of government overthrows in the coups that are happening in West Africa are largely down to what ECOWAS has done in the past and what ECOWAS is doing now because ECOWAS is basically a French entity in West Africa. That's what it is. It's a French organization fronted by black people, West African people. Why we cannot cut the shackles of colonialism just like East Africa, just like North Africa, just cut the French out of our affairs. Nobody's saying we, we should wage war against France, no. Nobody's saying we cannot deal with France in terms of trade or security or other bilateral or multilateral agreements. Nothing is wrong with that. I don't have problems with that. Africa should not wage war against people. We don't have time for it. 
We don't have the resources for it. We don't have the military power to take the United States on or France or Britain or other imperial powers who are still exploiting Africa. We don't have that. But ECOWAS could have in 2016 and should have encouraged the ECOWAS judges and Commonwealth judges to go to Gambia. Even if the allegations that the opposition were bandying about were true, that the Supreme Court didn't sit for about six months because the ex-president dismissed the judges. Fine. Even if that was the case, the Supreme Court had judges allocated to it in September 2016. Their arrival and, and, and uh, commencement of sittings at the Supreme Court was delayed for whatever reasons, I do not know. But if there were important, compelling matters like the election petition of 2017, the Commonwealth uh, judges and ECOWAS judges should have been put together by ECOWAS in the interest of fairness and in accordance with the constitutional provisions of the Republic of the Gambia, allow the Supreme Court to sit. If the Supreme Court sat and said the elections were free and fair, then you can put a force together to force President Jame out, a military force to push President Jame out, as you did illegally. You basically invaded Gambia and brought about an unconstitutional change of government. Let's move away from that. That's one problem that ECOWAS caused. And that was not the end of it because ECOWAS did that in Guinea-Bissau. ECOWAS is ignoring it in Senegal. ECOWAS ignored it in, in, in other countries, in Mali, in, in Guinea. ECOWAS is watching all these things happen and they're doing nothing about it. In Burkina Faso, it's the same problem we have. But I'm going to go to Gambia, why we're suffering now, the lack of leadership. Adam Abaro, as you all know, if you're Gambian, you now know, that Barrow is not educated. His education is pretty much elementary. And education doesn't have to be Western academic education. Education doesn't have to be uh, uh, Arabic academic education. Education is basically your acumen, intellectual acumen. Yes, Western or Arabic structured education is how we test people for their intellectual capacity. That's how we test people. Some people are street wise. Some people are academically wise. Some people are built up their wisdom, your, their intellectual pedigree over a, a number of years because of working in the civil service or working in huge companies, multinational companies, or working for international agencies. So they know protocol. They know uh, structured ways of dealing with issues. They know how to administer units or administer one or two people or they know how to run things. They know experience. They have experience of handling uh, uh, basically transactions. They know how to communicate formally. They know how to investigate matters formally. This is something that Adam Abaro doesn't have. He never had it. And six years in his job, the man is getting worse on every single aspect of the job. Adam Abaro has not improved communication-wise. He's not improved in terms of his intelligence with security. He has not improved in terms of his intelligence with trade. He has not improved in terms of education. He has not improved in terms of health. Nothing has improved under Adam Abaro. In fact, things are getting worse. And I'll get to that point in a minute because I want to look at health. I want to look at education. I want to look at the environment. I want to look at trade. I want to look at the position we are at now in terms of the debt ceiling of the Republic of the Gambia is ridiculous, it's serious. Basically, the Republic of the Gambia is on the brink of economic collapse. We have been in recession since last year because in 2021, Adam Barrow's government dropped our GDP went to 1.5%, minus 1.5%, minus 1.5% of our GDP. That's what the economy was growing at, and that's scary. Even at the worst of times under President Jame, under President Jame, 2009, when the economic crisis hit the entire globe, Gambia, Gam, Gambian farmers suffered crop failure. Total, not total crop failure, but a significant crop failure. Twice during that period between 2009 and 2014, when the economy started recovering, Gambian farmers suffered from serious crop failure. Twice. That's the worst time in President Jame's time. The economy was growing at 2.9% of GDP. That's what he was doing at that time. That, President Jame's worst performance 
figures in his time. And to compound that misery during President Jammer's era, there was Ebola, which nearly killed our tourism. Ebola was in Sierra Leone, in Guinea, the two Guineas, Guinea and Guinea-Bissau, and in Senegal. Gambia didn't have any case, but Gambia obviously was affected because Western tourists thought, oh, that enclave of West Africa is suffering from Ebola. Therefore, we're not going to go to Gambia on uh, tourism. A lot of tourist flights and a lot of tourist bookings and other things. The normal flow of tourists to the Republic of the Gambia suffered for two seasons in a row because of Ebola. Even with that, President Jammer's worst performance growth, growth performance, was 2.9%. Last year we went to 1.5%. Maybe it's got worse this year because the price of every single thing, inflation is hitting Gambia like crazy. Yes, inflation is hitting everywhere. Inflation is hitting the United Kingdom. It's decimating Europe. It's destroying America. America United States is effectively in recession because their economic, economy hasn't grown uh, significantly over the last two quarters. The United Kingdom is the same. The economy hasn't grown significantly. In fact, the economy was shrinking in two quarters in the United Kingdom. It only grew, grew marginally in the last two, three weeks. No, about three, four weeks ago, just before the Queen's death or the passing away of the Queen of the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom economy was, grew at a negative in two quarters. If it went to a third quarter with that, it's a confirmed recession in every way. But most economists confirmed that the United Kingdom economy was in recession before the passing away of the Queen anyway. It just rebounded by a fraction about two or three weeks before the Queen passed away. The United States is all he but heading into recession. So Gambia government is not a surprise. We went into recession last year, 2021, effectively, even before the war in Ukraine started. So now they have conveniently blamed the war in Ukraine, just like the United Kingdom, which refused to acknowledge that it's the war in Ukraine that's ruined the United Kingdom economy. Now they're admitting that, yes, since Russia's, spe Russia's special operation in Ukraine, uh, our economy has been going down because of the energy crisis, the cost of commodities, the cost of foods, everything has gone up. The inflation has hit the pound. So basically, that mini budget that was delivered by the Chancellor last week, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, of England. Uh, we call our finance minister in England the Chancellor. So he delivered a mini budget and that hit the pound down further and the pound went down so hard for the first time in a long time in 37 years the pound got to that level, low level. So the pound is $1.12 right now. Yeah, that's what the pound, pound is at now. The pound never came below $1.20 uh, before. It's now 1.2, 12 cents, all right? And the EU is the same. The euro is plummeting. It's only the dollar that's getting strong against the other currencies, but that will be a different analysis. So back in the Gambia, why are we suffering this? In the United Kingdom, United States, the European Union, and other African countries, I heard William Ruto saying, we're doing this and this and that to improve the economic situation of Kenyans. Kenyan citizens are suffering a lot. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to cut tax. I'm going to increase taxes. I'm going to reinstate this. I'm going to cut subsidies to be able to help the poor Kenyans. Many presidents across the globe are doing everything possible for their people to be able to boost the economy, to be able to control the inflation, to be able to help the citizens cope with the global rise in prices of commodities. Gambia's president never addressed those things. He never talks about it because he doesn't know. The man has got absolutely no knowledge of what to do to help control inflation in the Gambia. The man has got no knowledge of what to do to be able to help Gambian households if they're not working for the government or private companies. Our tourism sector is dead. Our agricultural sector was dead for five years. I'll see whether this year, borough government is going to be able to afford ground nuts and other commodities that have been produced by Gambian farmers. From what I'm seeing right now, it's going to be another total failure after this hard rainy season where most of the crops that were first planted in the Gambia basically were uh, ruined because it didn't rain for about two, three, four weeks. 
We saw the first rains, and the first rains came regularly, and the farmers thought, okay, we're effectively in the rainy season now. Let's start planting our seeds. Let's start sowing the seeds. They did, and then two, three weeks, four weeks later, no rains fell, and all of a sudden the rain started coming regularly, uh, uh, even heavier than we thought. So most of the first seeds that were sown basically perished, and people had to restart. With all of this hardship, all of the work that the Gambian farmers are putting in to be able to feed the Gambian population, Adam Barrow's government increased the price of fertilizer to $2,000, is $2,500, is $3,000 is per bag of fertilizer. To give you an idea, under President Jame, despite the crop failure, despite Ebola, without, despite the global economic crisis of 2009 to 2014, the price of fertilizer never went, a bag of fertilizer never went beyond $600. How did President Jame achieve that? He didn't blame the war in Libya. Because Libya was supporting the African Union. Libya was giving subsidies to many African countries and supporting them in many areas. When Gaddafi was overthrown, assassinated by NATO, United States, United Kingdom, and France, when they went to kill Gaddafi because of many reasons that we all know now, I don't have to repeat why, NATO, United States, well, NATO is basically United States and European countries, all right? I don't want to give you reasons why they went and assassinated Gaddafi. This was not Libyan protesters that assassinated Gaddafi, but I'll come to that in a minute. This is where ECOWAS comes to play. I'll come to that. I'll come, that will be my last topic, the Pan-African aspect. All right? But I'm giving an idea of what President Jame had in place to help Gambian citizens. And indeed, today, Gambian citizens are crying for President Jame's return. Openly. Most of them know we've had better times under him. No matter how difficult the global crisis was economically, President Jame found a way to look after Gambian people and make sure the impact on Gambian people was minimal. Yes, tourism struggled under him during Ebola. We still did okay. Crop failures twice, we still did okay. He didn't blame the assassination of Gaddafi for the rising price of commodities. He didn't blame the Arab Spring for the rising uh, cost of commodities, and President Jame was doing a lot of trade with Egypt, especially in the health sector. He was ordering majority of Gambian medicines from Egypt. Yes, but Egypt was suffering at that time. There was turmoil in Egypt, Tunisia, Libya, Algeria, everywhere. It affected the African economy until the Arab North Africa settled down. Whether you like it or not, uncertainty is not good for markets. Financial markets hate speculation. They hate uncertainty. Whenever there is upheaval anywhere, the economies tumble. They start getting jittery. Adam Abaro has not stood before Gambian people since last year when his economy went into minus to say to Gambian people, yes, I understand your suffering. I am responsible for this suffering because I am your president. And this is what I am doing with my ministers to be able to make the lives of poor Gambian people, especially the 60% unemployed. This is what we're doing to make their lives better. No, instead, it's been the increased rise of uh, prices of commodities. This is like it started way back in 2018. They're blaming the Ukraine war conveniently because now everyone will blame the Ukraine war. Fine, it's true. The Ukraine war just made things worse. But the rise of commodities, prices of commodities under Adam Barrow started back in 2000, 2018 or 2019 when we saw the price of Gambian fish, locally sourced fish. This is not imported fish. Fish from our rivers, fish from our Atlantic Ocean, the mouth of the River Gambia was going up. I saw fish that used to cost a few hundred dollars at that time. They were selling it for seven thousand dollars. Yes, a big, uh, what do you call it? Was it a barracuda or cat, catfish sort of thing? It's a big one. Anyway, in local language, you call it ngunja. It's a big one. They were selling it for a few thousand dollars. The price of fish, bonga fish, started going up well before we even thought about this, even before anyone imagined that Russia will launch their special operation in Ukraine. The price of rice and sugar started going well before last year. Started growing up. And when people interviewed, you can go and find Adam Barrow's interviews. When they interviewed and said, well, Adam Abaro, 
the price of sugar has gone up. The price of rice has gone up. The price of eggs has gone up. The price of flour has gone up. He'll say, oh, but if you go to shop XYZ, you'll find a, a bag of rice for $900. Even though he knew it was not true. He would say that to Gambian people instead of saying to Gambian people, oh, really? I'll investigate it and I'll come back to you. If it's true that the price of rice has gone up to 1500 for the, the poorest of rice, bags of rice, gone up to 1500 I'll come back to Gambian people. I'll put in measures to be able to improve the price of rice, the price of meat, the price of fish, the price of oil, the price of flour. I will put everything in place to be able to help Gambian people. He never does that. He tries to find an excuse that doesn't exist. And indeed, this is the Gambian president. Imagine the president of your country telling people that it's okay to lie. When he's standing on a campaign platform or standing before the public, it's okay to tell them stuff that you know you're not going to be able to implement. That's what he said to Gambian people. Yeah? He said, when you're on the campaign trail, sorry, let me plug my phone in because the battery warning came. He said, when you're on the campaign trail, you can tell people what you want to tell them, what you want them to hear, even if you know you're not going to implement it. So therefore, when people said to Adam Aboro, the cost of living is going through the roof. Rent is going through the roof. Fuel is the most expensive in our sub-region. Gambia has the most expensive fuel prices in the enclave, Senegambia enclave, Guinea, the two Guineas, Senegal, Mali, and the Gambia. I'm not sure about Mali because the uh, ineffective, the spineless ECOWAS put sanctions on Mali. I don't know why they put sanctions on Mali. How is ECOWAS going to be able to police the trade between Mali and Mauritania, the trade between Mali and Guinea, the trade between Mali and Burkina Faso, the trade between Mali and Algeria? How was ECOWAS going to implement it? They had no capability of implementing it. Because ECOWAS is toothless. ECOWAS is the one that's encouraging a lot of this nonsense that's happening in our sub-region politically. I'll come to that in a minute. But back to the Gambia. Every head of state, even Joe Biden, with all his ineffectiveness, with all his sleepiness, he'll stand up before American people, he'll threaten the businesses that if they increase the prices of commodities and affect the inflation that's already ravaging their economy, he was going to take serious steps against businesses. He's, he was going to take serious steps against importers, against institutions that are raising the price of commodities in America. In Britain, our new prime minister has put a cap on fuel pri or energy prices. So energy companies cannot increase the prices like they wanted to three, four months ago. He's also put in tax cuts to be able to help employed people so that they can keep more money in their pockets instead of uh, paying more taxes. All right, because we're paying a lot of taxes. The money you earn after tax is not enough to take you until your next salary the following month. So therefore, the less money taken from your earnings, the better it is. Yes, tax cuts always, always favor the wealthy people. Yeah, that, that's, that's certain. We know that. And people are complaining. But unfortunately, it's the same. If you're rich or you're poor, we should all be treated equally. So if you cut tax, you cannot cut tax for the poor and then say, all right, the rich people, I'm not going to cut tax for it. That's discrimination. They're wealthy doesn't mean we should treat them differently. But if you cut one P, one P or penny from the taxes, it's going to affect, uh, uh, benefit somebody who's got one million pounds compared to somebody who's got 10 pounds. Because one P cut doesn't benefit somebody who's got 10 pounds at all. But somebody who's got one million pounds, that's almost like 1,000, 10,000 uh, pound savings every month. Yeah? That's what it is. That's what it is. I am a firm believer of equality. Whether somebody is black or white, man or woman, young or old, fat or slim, yeah? Equality. If you tax somebody 10%, you tax the other person 10%. You don't go to poor people and say, all right, you're not supposed to pay tax. No. If you create a welfare system, where the taxes paid can then go and help the poor people. That's the kind of party that I support. Social Democrats. The APRC is a social democratic party that takes the wealth, sovereign wealth from the government and helps the needy people. But then the taxes, hospital fees and other things have to be paid equally. 
you cannot have a rich people come to our referral hospital, Edward Francis Moore Teaching Hospital, and say, oh, because you're rich, you've got to pay $10. 10 oh, because you're poor, you're going to pay $1 for your treatment. No, you create a welfare system where everyone pays the same, but the poor person's payment is subsidized. You don't earn anything, so therefore you don't pay. Or you don't earn anything, just give us a token payment of $1 or $5 for your treatment at our main referral hospital. The Gambia's president never does that. Gambian youths are killing each other. Every single day, several murders. Adam Abaro is not addressing it. He says, oh, I'm going to call security chiefs and, and, and discuss the uh, rampant, escalating crime rates in the Gambia. What are your security chiefs going to do? What are you going to give them to be able to fight crime effectively? What are the problems? Why is crime rate going up? Unemployment, frustration. They're seeing the president himself involved in corruption. When Adam Barrow came newly, as a poor person, he built himself a mansion in his village, massive mansion. He sent his children to the United States straight away for education. That's what he did. Even before he spent five, six months in power, he started building himself mansions, started sending his kids to foreign universities, schools, colleges in the United States. This is a previously poor church mouse. He had no money. If he had money, why was his son waiting until he became president before he sent him to the United States? Why didn't he build this mansion in Mankamankunda, his village, before he became president? This man, Adam Abaro, started the embezzlement himself. And when they asked him, oh, how come you're building a new mansion at your place just after just coming into office? He says, oh, some philanthropist said that now that he's president, he cannot live in his mother's house that he had in the village. And they offered to build him a new mansion for free. They, they, he's got gifted a mansion. Who gives you that much money for free? Nobody does. They give it to you for a reason. They want something out of it. That's what he did. Next thing you know, his son is in America. Next thing you know, allegations that he bought a mansion in America for his son. Next thing you know, you hear that his son is driving the supercars in America. Meanwhile, the people who put him there, who had hope in him, I didn't have hope in him when I heard his two interviews before he was sworn in. I thought this was a big mistake. Even if you don't like President Jame, removing him for this Adam Aboro was a massive mistake. And I was not wrong. I wrote a post on the 26th of January, 2017. It's like gospel now. Everything that I said we will lose to Senegal, that Senegal was not helping us genuinely, turned out to be true. That's exactly what happened. Gambia's lost herself to Senegal now. Adam Barrow's bodyguards are Senegalese. State House, where the president works and lives in the Gambia right now, is Senegal. Apparently, the dialect is entirely Senegalese dialect now. Full of them. We've lost our state house to Senegal. His wife's bodyguards, Senegalese, according to sources. His own security, our military barracks and our, and our national security is run by Senegal. The economy is run by Senegal. Our cashew trade run by Senegal. Our port has been run by Senegal. Even our airport has been threatened right now. Yes, Senegalese aviation or Whatever industry manages their airports and aviation threatened to go on strike and Gambia airport was supposed to be closed for 24 hours, 48 hours, 72 hours. Thank God that didn't happen in the end. But I wrote this few months ago that don't be surprised one day to hear that Gambian airport is no longer safe to fly in and out of. That we should be flying in and out of Senegal and travel by land to the Republic of the Gambia. Don't be surprised. I wrote it and people thought it was a joke because we've lost everything. Our fisheries is Senegal, security is Senegal, President Barrow's bodyguard is Senegal, his wife's bodyguard is Senegal, territorial integrity is Senegal, sovereignty is Senegal. Everything is gone. Even our toll roads, Gambian citizens have been reduced to second class, third class. Because Gambian drivers, commercial drivers, pay $500 to cross our own bridge, Trans Transgambia Bridge. Which again, Adam Abaro gave the name to Senegal. The bridge was supposed to be called Transgambia Bridge because of Senegal, his boss in Senegal, because the current president of Senegal installed Adam Abaro in the Gambia with the help of the French. So Gambia is right now a French colony. 
Simple as that. That's no argument because we all know it's happening in broad daylight. People can see it. All right? It's a French colony. Yeah? So Gambian commercial drivers are paying $500 to cross our own Gambian bridge. Supposed to be Trans Gambia Bridge. They're calling it Senegambia Bridge. And Senegalese commercial drivers are paying $300 to cross the same bridge. This is what brought the strike two weeks ago, sit-down strike between commercial drivers of the Gambia. Because they are being treated like second or third class citizens on their own roads, on their own bridge. And that's what Adam Abaro is doing. Yes, guys, thank you for tuning in. I appreciate it. I am doing live on Facebook now going forward. Not Facebook, sorry. YouTube going forward because Facebook has restricted my accounts. They said I went against their community. I don't know what community. They, Facebook must be running an anti-truth community. <laughs> I don't swear. I don't insult people. So I don't know what community I went against. But anyway, I'm doing live on YouTube going forward. So this is my channel. Make sure you tune into it. You subscribe on it. Uh, I'll be going on live on a regular basis on this channel. I'll share the link on Facebook, obviously, but I'll be going live here because Facebook doesn't want people to see what I'm writing anymore. Uh, Facebook has been defollowing people on our wall. The United States of Africa should have had more than 1 million followers by now. But every time we go close to 500,000 followers, Facebook removes our followers because anything that talks about the unity of Africa is a big problem. Welcome to the Pan-African aspect. I'm talking about the Republic of the Gambia now. The rampant corruption. Millions gone missing in our judiciary, which was supposed to be the cleanest institution in the country, because the judiciary of the Gambia is supposed to straighten people up. But this is what happens. When your leadership sets bad examples, and your leadership is involved in the corruption itself, that's what happens. Everyone gets in on the act. And that's what's affecting the Gambia today. Everyone is taking as much as they can. They're defrauding the instit public institutions. They're embezzling funds. They're stealing it. They're defrauding the taxpayers. And Adam Abaro cannot do anything about it because the people who are doing it know his dart already. This is why, as a leader, you need to set very good examples. If you don't, the people around you are going to look at you and think, all right, well, the president himself is at it. His ministers are at it. We're talking about the minister of uh, tourism, who's the most traveled minister in borough government. We're looking at other ministers, minister of youths and sports. The ministers, the two ministers of justice, the ex-minister of justice, Bartambedu, and the current minister of justice, Dauda Jalo. All of them are at it. Money that was meant for Gambia government from the Rohingya genocide prosecution or case at the International Criminal Court, money was meant for the Gambia government and the taxpayers. People under Dauda Jalo and the Minister of Justice decided to share that money between themselves. And that money was not meant for them because they were doing that job in the Gambia government's time, using Gambia government resources. So therefore, they are already being paid by Gambia government to do this work. When that money was sent to the Republic of the Gambia, officials of the Minister of Justice, who were supposed to be transparent, who were supposed to be straight who were supposed to be advising the government and warning the government about wrongdoing they decided they're going to take about two hundred thousand dollars or something like that more than that that money to share between themselves and the alleged fifty thousand dollars that was refunded to the gambian taxpayers also went missing in the ministry of justice we've seen 11 seen 11 million gone missing in our judiciary again we've seen drugs go missing from our law courts but when you ask Adam Abaro these questions, he will have no answer to give you. This is why we have a leadership vacuum. People have got nobody to inspire them. People know there are no consequences for wrongdoing under Adam Abaro. The people around him who know something are capitalizing because you will never ever have an administration like this where the leader himself is involved openly in embezzling public funds. The leader himself is spineless, he's toothless. He's not going to do anything to rectify the wrongdoing in the country. He's called the security chiefs. When the election, presidential election came, this man had about 100 pickup trucks to 200 pickup trucks, Adam Abaro, for himself and his people in his political party. Yet this man cannot provide 20 pickup trucks to our police force and motorbikes or other forms of mobility, even if it's bicycles. He couldn't provide them to our police force to our army, to our paramilitary, 
to be able to patrol the streets regularly to clamp down on crime rates. People are losing their sons, people are losing their daughters, and indeed, even our main referral hospital cannot have water. The simplest of things. Gambia has a low water table. We can have a tank at Edward Francis Small Teaching Hospital. There's no reason why the National Water and Electricity Company cannot supply our main referral hospital water 24-7, 365 days of the year. How can you have water, water shortages at the hospital? Electricity cuts, power cuts at the hospital. No oxygen, no surgical gloves, no blood. Nothing is happening there, not even paracetamol in our hospitals. You go to hospital, they give you prescriptions and you go to pharmacies. How are the 60% unemployed in our country going to survive what's going on right now? It's impossible. And this is why we're having a high mortality rate. But the Minister of Health is covering up, is lying, that the mortality rates have improved. The Director of Medical Services is covering up, is lying, uh, that we, we, uh, the mortality rates haven't gone up. We have seen the epidemic of child deaths in our hospitals. 40 children died from kidney infections or whatever was causing the death in our main referral hospital. 40 children, just like that. Oh, they said, first they said, oh, it's E. coli. Next minute, oh, uh, the kidneys have been poisoned or they've been poisoned and their kidney failure. All the little children, babies. And then they blamed it on paracetamol that they were giving babies at hospital. Really? What sort of paracetamol is going to kill people like that? Babies in hospital. 40 of them. What are they going to do or say to those parents whose children died because of medical negligence? High mortality, maternal mortality rate. High infant mortality rate in hospital. How are they going to rectify it? What are they going to say to those mothers and those fathers for the deaths of their children? Are they going to continue to cover up? Blame something else? Because these things started happening recently, and it was a coincidence that during that period, the Gambia government suspended 371 public health officers. And the public health officers are the first point of contact for the community. They're very important in terms of primary health care, prevention of disease. That's where public health officers come in. But the minister, Dr. Ahmadu Samate, the minister of health on the borough government, is busy fighting against public health officers in his government. He's not giving them their juice. He's not giving them what they deserve. He's not giving them the facilities. He's not even giving them equality in terms of promotion, in terms of facilities, in terms of appointment, in terms of kit to fight against diseases. And I can tell you, as a public health officer before, the importance of public health cannot be measured. Prevention is better than cure. Those are the proverbs we learned, the idioms we learned in primary school. Prevention is better than cure. I was a public health officer in the Gambia. Three years as an attache student. One year as a full-time employee. Well, six months as a full-time employee. I can tell you the importance of public health. Under us, or during our period, or during President Jamis' period, Yellow fever was eradicated in the Gambia. Polio was eradicated in the Gambia. Mumps, measles, rubella were, were non-existent. All gone, thanks to the public health outreach and the additional hospitals and health centers that were built by the AFPRC, APRC government. Facilities were there for health workers to go to the remotest villages. The road network that came up by the APRC government that President Jamie built to the remotest place telephone communication to the remotest place, rural electrification. All these things had positive impact on the development of the Republic of the Gambia. And that positive development impact also had a positive uh, effect on other things like prevention of diseases. Polio never came, but now I've seen that polio has returned to the Gambia. People's children are going to get disabilities again, serious infections. Babies are going to die again from these infections. Why? Because the outreach that was there before has now shrunk. Facilities are not there. If the police, the army, the paramilitary cannot have enough vehicles to be able to stabilize the crime rates in the country, what chance do the public health officers have? Is borough government going to give them vehicles? A lot of these vehicles that broke down when Jame left, and the motorbikes and other things, they have not been replaced by borough government. So the police are saying, in fact, the police... Public relations officer came and said, they need facilities. They need resources to be able to fight the crime rates. Now, at 8 o'clock p.m., when it starts getting dark in the Gambia, 
our women cannot go out. The streets are owned by criminals. Our homes are being threatened by criminals. People are not even comfortable in their own homes now. Not just the streets. The streets have been overrun by criminals. The police can't tackle them. The army has been reduced to watchmen. They can't do anything because the army is begging lifts to go to their barracks to go and serve for the day, nine to five, come back frustrated. Nothing is happening because Baro has sidelined our Gambia National Army and brought in the Senegalese to look after our, our security. That's why Senegal installed it. They didn't install Adama Baro because they wanted Gambia to go forward. They didn't ask France to fund Adama Baro's government when he was hiding in Senegal to fund the military in the Gambia and ECOWAS because they wanted ECOWAS or Gambia to advance as a nation. You see, this is what I'm going to talk about when I come to the Pan-African bit. I just want to explain to Gambian people what's happening. And the scandals on the Adama Baro government are just... I can talk about them for the next week and I will not finish. We've seen what's happening recently at Immigration Department. The Director of General of Immigration Department. Another department where it's be, basically the department has been in constant scandal since 2019. The Director General of Immigration is married to an immigration officer. All right? Apparently, he's having lots of other issues with his juniors, female juniors. But I'm not gonna I'm not gonna talk about that in detail. Basically, what's happening there? The director general of immigration married an immigration officer. That immigration officer got into uh, an alleged criminal activity with other officers at immigration department. The other officers that she was involved with in the fraud, alleged fraud, because they're claiming that they got into a deal with a tourist boat and took money. Instead of taking that money to the department, they took the money and shared it between themselves. His wife, the director of immigration's wife, was involved in that crime, alleged crime. All the other officers are still facing trials, except the director of immigration's wife, who was dropped of all the charges. They didn't even charge her. The allegations were basically dropped. All right? And then he appointed... Uh, basically transferred his wife to another station, immigration station in Banjul. Now the wife is transferred to somewhere else and promoted on top of that. The same director general of immigration is having serious issues with his juniors, female juniors. I'll come to that in a minute. I like the officers who are on stress, sick, because they don't want to go to work, because the guy is basically a predator. If you watch Family Guy, the Director General of Immigration is basically a threat to his junior officers. That's what he's doing. You go to fisheries. This is what's going on at fisheries department. We've seen the transfer of permanent secretaries. Permanent secretary one, permanent secretary two, transferred because the new minister of fisheries cannot get his way to corrupt the industry, to corrupt the department. And that new Minister of Fisheries is Barrow's number one person. Whatever corruption he gets involved in, Barrow must be having a share in it. Because I can't understand how this person, after being exposed several times, after he was involved in many scandals, Barrow is still retaining him and moving him from one department to the other. Yes, Musa Dramit. Is the new fisheries minister had to transfer his permanent secretary because the permanent secretary refused for Musa Drama to use the 70, 80, 90 million dollars that belongs to the department. That was put aside by the Ministry of Fishery for a rainy day. They are put it aside so that when they need facilities for the department, instead of relying on the central government for subvention or funds coming from the central government, they can use that money to spend to keep the department running. The minister, new minister came, saw that money, and he got tempted straight away. He wants to take money to put it into politics to make Adam Abaro look good. But that money was generated by the department. The department is saving it for a rainy day. It's exactly the same thing that happened to the army between 2017 and 2020. The army had reserves in dollars, Gambia National Army. But the former chief of defense staff depleted those accounts completely and put the money to his own use. That's the same thing the minister is doing. But Barrow cannot stop him because Barrow is already dirty. 
if people know your dad, you're involved, it's open. Baro could not build those two mansions in Mankabankunda, a police station, a mosque, and other things in the space of uh, a year or two of being in office. It's not possible. He's not paid that much money. The three million dollars he gets a year as his salary can't build one of the mansions he built in Mankabankunda. It's not possible. On the contrary, President Jami still hasn't finished his house in Kanilai after being in power for 22 years. That's the difference between leaders. A leader looks after his people first. And then he can have his own share. Barrow came and started self-serving. And his ministers, they started serving themselves. Most of them now own one, two, three, four, five, six mansions, estates in different places. And their ministerial salaries are not enough to give them these estates, these mansions everywhere. But this is what's going on now. You look at our education sector, the University of the Gambia is collapsing. Gambia College is already collapsed. The Gambia College campus or school of nursing in Bansang collapsed already. They had to close it. The Bassa College nearly closed or probably closed by now. Because Adama Barrow's government doesn't have funds to be able to run these institutions. Really? They have funds. These people have been given so much money. A lot of it. So much money by international agencies. And the international agencies stated it. We never gave this much money to President Jammer before. We gave this amount of money in about three, four years. The amount of money they gave to Barrow is more than the 22 years of President Jammer. But what President Jammer achieved during this period is, is incomparable to what Barrow, Barrow achieved. I heard Barrow saying to Gambian people, oh, uh, when I came in, there were road projects that were being negotiated for 30 years. They never got implemented. When I came in, I implemented these roads. 120 kilometers of roads are built. Which road is that? What 120 kilometer road is Barrow referring to? That's no 120 kilometer road that Barrow built since he came to this day. The road he's talking about is probably Lamenkoto Pasamas, and I shared the video yesterday so people can see it when the uh, road was being launched by President Jan. In fact, when Barrow came, Lamenkoto Pasamas was already 40 kilometers built out of the 120 or out of the 100 kilometers. 40 kilometers of, of it were already built. So which road is Barrow talking about? 120 kilometers. Because Hakalang Road is 81 kilometers. That road is dead. Farato Jambu Road is not, is not even 30 kilometers. That road is dead. Fatoto Koina was already signed before Barrow came to power. Those bridges in Wuli Base Road, Wuli Base, those were the BRI, Chinese Initiative with President Jami. Belts and Roads Initiative, Obo, One Belt, One Road Initiative. Barrow didn't build them. The nine inner roads in Sierra that are going to be built, were supposed to be built by now if President Jami was in power. Nine inner roads in Sierra were signed, sealed by President Jami. The Kian Karantaba Road was signed, sealed by President Jami. So which road is Barrow referring to? Which 120 kilometer road? But then it's the same Barrow who said, when you face people, which includes the media, you can lie. It's okay to lie as a head of state. That's what Barrow is telling people. You can say things even if you don't want to do them. Even if you know you're not going to do them. Even if you don't have the desire to do them. Just like he promised Gambian people, the Banjul Barra Bridge, 60 mosques. 50 hospitals in Sierra, 20,000 jobs in Combo South, free Wi-Fi in Brikama, Wi-Fi gardens across the Republic of the Gambia. He promised Gambian people all of those things, knowing fully well that he was not going to implement them. But that's what he told Gambian people. You can lie. A head of state standing before his subjects, his population, and telling them, you can tell people what you want, even if you're not going to implement them. You can tell people what you want. Barrow's gone to the United Nations General Assembly. His government cannot afford vehicles to give to the police to fight crime. He has no interest. But Barrow hired a private jet between himself and his friends to go to New York for the General Assembly. When he came back, they interviewed him and said, 
what have you achieved at the UN General Assembly? He said the trip was successful. In what way? He went to Congo, came back there, asked him, he said the trip was successful. In what way? He went to China, came back there, asked him, the trip. he said the trip was successful. In what way? Every borough trip is successful, but he never tells you what he came back with from those trips. He'll always tell you, oh, it's a successful trip. What did you achieve? Nothing. He went to the United Nations General Assembly and spoke about things that had nothing to do with Gambia. Oh, uh, he supposed China's position in respect of Taiwan. Yeah. So why are you repeating at the UN General Assembly? Oh, uh, climate change here and there, true. Climate change is probably affecting Gambia. We had floods and they exposed to your Banjul project, your corrupt Banjul project. That had nothing to do with climate change of this year. Banjul flooded last year, 2021. Banjul flooded in 2020. Banjul flooded uh, in two years in a row before Gambians went to the poll. But the Banjulians still went and voted for Adam Abaro just because they want chicken change. They were celebrating when Barrow gave them $2 million. Where's that $2 million now? Probably been digested and thrown away somewhere. They're complaining now that things are hard. Banjul is hard. Banjul floods every time there's heavy rain. The roads in Banjul, like Bond Road, are disappearing. President Jame built those roads. He created the defense around Banjul and created an artificial beach, natural beach, after the defense. He saved Banjul back in 1995, 96, 97 when he came. I can't remember when the project started to defend Banjul from the mouth of the river, river Gambia and the other sides and built Bond Road. Now, Bond Road is all but disappearing. Adam Abaro and his government have got no interest in defending Banjul. They have no interest in making Banjul the capital city that it should have been. The roads are falling apart. He went and concreted the roads without putting in adequate drainage. He allowed the new com container terminal to be erected right in the path of the water runoffs. Now he's allowing people to drill sand in Banjul. Already Banjul is at sea level or below sea level. And you're allowing people to go and do sand mining on a waterlogged capital. But this is what I said before. If you have no experience and you have no academic education and you have no desire like Barrow, he is one of he is all those three, you cannot run a country. Barrow is just existing because people just call him president. I don't know why he went to Mali, but I'll come to that on the Pan African section. I want Gambian people to understand one thing. Our problems will not be solved until Barrow leaves. I said this before. He's the number one problem because he can't clamp down on people. He has no interest in clamping down on people who are doing wrong things under him because Barrow himself is involved. This is the problem we have. Barrow himself is involved in the wrongdoing. How is he going to clamp down on them? Barrow has never taken any action against anyone, despite the fact that several people were caught in corruption scandals under him. He still employs them. Barrow's own foreign diplomats were involved in scandals. There's one that was in another country, uh, African Youth Parliament, embezzled $71,000. Barrow has reappointed him. Barrow's ambassadors were involved in pornography in Gambian embassies abroad. He's reappointed them. The criminals who embezzled funds under Barrow, he's reemployed them. How do you think Gambia's problems will be alleviated with Barrow at the helm? It's not going to happen. Barrow is our problem. The one main problem. It's not the only problem, but he's the main problem, the biggest one. And until we shunt him aside, our country is not going to lift itself out of poverty. Our country is not going to be able to tackle crime. Our country is not going to be able to have adequate medical care. Our country is not going to have a decent environment because look at the beach. The videos are coming. These are people who put Barrow in power. Now they're sharing videos of how polluted our coastline is. And I'm an environmentalist. I can tell you where that pollution is coming from. They sent inspectors to go and inspect companies that caused the pollution. What did they do? The Chinese set the dogs on government inspectors so the dogs can bite them to stop them inspecting the factories that are polluting our pristine waters. The beaches around Gunjur polluted. The waterways around Gunjur polluted. Our beaches are polluted. 
the fishes are getting beached on our uh, uh, on our shores. Our fish fisheries are getting depleted. Even our nurseries are getting depleted because the Chinese boats are now going in stream or downstream. All right, and then fishing in our nurseries that used to be the uh, ground from where the fishes were produced, and then they go to sea. This is why we have it. Uh, basically, our fish stock has has been basically depleted. Our fishermen go to sea and come back with very little catches compared to yesteryears. Thanks to Adam Abaro. Yes, Senegal sells our fishing li licenses or issues our fishing licenses to other agencies. And who are the people fishing in our waters? Senegal, France, EU, Chinese. EU paid us 600,000 euros a year for something they'll be getting 10, 15, 20, 50 million euros a year. We're getting only 500 and something thousand euros a year for something that EU will be getting millions from every year. Why? Even the former fisheries minister said those licenses or agreements, fishing agreements, his department signed with Senegal, EU, France, and the Chinese were illegal fishing deals. And when they arrest Ill illegal trawlers, fishing trawlers, they take the bribes and they allow them to go back again and continue on the illegality. This is what happens when you're doing wrong things. If you're doing wrong things, you can never punish anyone. And the people you took bribes from will keep on blackmailing you. You cannot do anything to us anymore because you took bribes. If you say something, we're going to expose you. That's why they can't do anything to the Chinese. They can't do anything to Senegal. Senegalese fishermen are chasing Gambian fishermen. I saw a video of Senegalese telling Gambian people what zones never to go to. In our own water, we become second class and third class citizens. They were chasing Gambian fishermen out of Gambian waters because they're not allowed to fish there. But the Chinese can deplete our sea, come to the mouth of the river Gambia, deplete it, and go uh, upstream on our small rivers to be able to kill our nursery again on top of that. This is what we're going through. But no single sector on the Adama Barrow is excelling. Corruption is rampant. Drugs are going missing. They've had this big drug find again two days ago. It won't be long before those drug, drugs go missing. You forget about it. I don't talk about those things anymore. Because I know what the outcome would be. The same people who are probably sponsoring Baro are the people bringing them in. But anyway, ECHO has decided that they are going to meet at the UN General Assembly and of all the peoples in this world that they could send to Mali. Now I'm going to my Pan-African side. All the people that ECOWAS could send to the Mali leader, Asimi Goita, they thought Adam Abaro was a good idea to go to Mali to talk to the junta. Basically, this is Adam Abaro who ignored his three-year transition period. The man was brought in accidentally According to the French media, and they are right, they are true, uh, so they are telling the truth, what they said is true. According to the French media, Adama Barrow is an accidental president, and everybody knows that. Nobody ever expected him to win the election in 2016. And matter of fact, he didn't win the election in 2016. And a matter of fact, in 2021, he didn't win the election. That's why two elections in a row, Adama Barrow and his people have refused to allow the petitions to go to the Supreme Court. In 2016, 2017, they intimidated the judges with the help of Senegal, help of France. Basically, France screwed West Africa, ECOWAS, and said, tell your judges not to go to uh, uh, Gambia or else they'll face serious consequences. We saw memos going around threatening the judges. Do you think this is just us threatening the judges? No. It is the French stooges, the stooges of the imperial powers who threatened judges not to go to the Gambia in 2016 and hear the election petition. The same people who frustrated the election petition of 2021, no, not the same people, similar people. Why did the election petition of 2021 fail? Because the Supreme Court of the Gambia, in their wisdom, said, if the petitioner served a notice on the protocol to the president, it is deemed good service. But if the same notice 
was served on the lawyer representing the president who was sued or who was petitioned. Imagine this. Listen to this, ladies and gentlemen. Because this, I've spoken to my colleague law students and my supervising lawyers I worked with at the law firm here in the United Kingdom. And they said, well, if they served it on the chief of protocol, who is actually not on the legal path in terms of dealing with notices, if the petitioner served a notice on the chief of protocol to the president and the Supreme Court thought that was good service, why then would serving on the lawyer who is representing the president in that same case, in fact, the lawyer is more relevant in the petition than the chief of protocol? So if you serve the, on the chief of protocol and you deem that appropriate service, why is serving on the lawyer representing the president in that same case deemed inappropriate service? But the Supreme Court of the Republic of the Gambia, in their wisdom, thought, ah, well, chief of protocol is good service, the lawyer is not good service. So therefore, for that reason, we're not going to allow the election petition to proceed to trial stage because they knew if that petition of 2021, December 2021, went to trial stage, the opposition APRC, GDC, UDP, GAP would have won that uh, trial. Hands down, because NPP were not hiding their bribery. They were not hiding the buying of votes. They were doing it plain and videoing it because they're so ignorant, they didn't know this was illegal. They were doing it. This is why they feared they did every single thing to frustrate that petition from proceeding to trial. NPP knew it. The videos are there. They're not hidden. The tampering of the electoral vote. The fact that our immigration department and securities cannot accept, access Semlex's database. This is where they all emanated from. The Supreme Court said, oh, because the petition was not submitted properly, we're going to strike out the election petition of 2021. And in 2016, oh, because uh, the Supreme Court didn't six for, sit for six months, we're not going to allow them to sit again. I mean, seriously? And this is ECOWAS encouraging it. And this is why there are so many coups in West Africa right now. In Niger, in Chad, in Guinea, Guinea-Bissau. Guinea-Bissau was the same thing. The Supreme Court made a ruling and ECOWAS went and helped the French puppet get sworn in in a hotel against the Supreme Court ruling in Guinea-Bissau. Election petition. ECOWAS went and encouraged that coup in Guinea-Bissau and put Omar Sisso Mbalo in power illegally. The same ECOWAS did that in Gambia. This is ECOWAS that's bringing West Africa down to its knees. And the same ECOWAS are so condemning the latest overthrow in Guinea-Bissau, where Colonel Demiba was kicked out by Captain Traore because Colonel Demiba started sleeping with French, the French. Colonel Demiba came in and kicked out Roach for being a French puppet. Because France pretends to go to West Africa to help West Africa fight terrorists, jihadists, they call it. These are people who were installed or implanted or sent to West Africa to attack countries. And when they start attacking, France will then turn around and say, oh, we're going to send our military to help you fight jihadists. But the funny thing is, these jihadists only go to places where there's gold mines, diamond mines, uranium mines, and things like that. And those are the only regions they're at. They'll attack every other region in Burkina Faso where there are resources. The only places they'll spare is where the Canadian mines are in Burkina Faso. They didn't go and attack the Canadian mines because they're doing this together. Remember, Canada was once a French colony, some parts of it. The other part is English. All right? They will not attack areas where U.S. mining companies are. They will not attack areas where French mining companies are. The jihadists will go to other mines that are controlled by the government. Jihadists. Why would Burkina Faso have a religious war? Why would Mali have a religious war all of a sudden? Why would Congo be having war?
Why did Sierra Leone have war? Why did Liberia have war? And of all the heads of states in Africa, ECOWAS decided Adam Abaro, who ignored his transition agreement, broke it blatantly because as soon as Adam Abaro was sworn in, he was already working out how he was going to break the coalition agreement, how he was going to stand elections and have a second term. He said in 2017, he met the traitors that came from the APRC party. That's what Adam Abaro himself said. He has no secret. He doesn't keep secrets. His mouth is slippery. He knows very little. No academic pedigree. No intellectual pedigree. No desire to transform the Republic of the Gambia. The difference between Adam Abaro and President Jame is President Jame will act when Gambia is threatened. Adam Abaro will not act when Gambia is threatened. Adam Abaro will act only when he, Adam Abaro, his position is threatened. That's what he said. He didn't mind when UDP was messing about under him when he came in for the first time or in the first time. But as soon as UDP started threatening his own position, Adam Abaro's position, he decided to suck UDP from the government. <laughs> Abaro said it. He said he didn't mind what they were doing. But when his position became a threat from Hussein Odabo and the UDP, he decided to act. But President Jame, he will leave, leave no stone unturned if Gambia is threatened. Adam Abaro doesn't care. You can threaten the medical sector. You can threaten the education sector. You can threaten the environmental fisheries. You can thre threaten trade. You can threaten every single thing. And he doesn't mind. He only acts when his position is threatened. The position of head of state. So of all the presidents, Adam Abaro, who ignored his transition agreement, ECOWAS thought in their wisdom that they were going to pick Adam Abaro and send him to, Guinea, uh, sorry, to Mali to tell the Mali junta to set up a transition and abide by it. <laughs> and when Adam Abaro fled Gambia and went to Mali, the current Mali leader, the president of Mali right now, Asimi Goeta, was one of the security people who helped Baro stay in safety. Baro was already safe in the Gambia, but because he's a coward and he always flees, he ran away. The French came and took him and took him to Mali, from Mali to Senegal. He was installed by Senegal and France because they wanted to get exactly what they're getting from the Republic of the Gambia right now. Macky Sall, the Senegalese president's son, is involved in Gambia's oil deal. We still can't find our oil in the Gambia. Macky Sall and France installed them. They're getting our fish for free. We're not seeing what they're paying our country in terms of using that money to develop the Republic of the Gambia. So France is getting our fish free. Senegal is getting our fish free. EU is getting it at a steal. The Chinese are getting it at a steal, and on top of that, we're getting the disrespect from the Chinese, setting their dogs on Gambian government inspectors who went to inspect their factory and find out why they were polluting our waters. The same waters where fish is supposed to grow, and then they can catch fish, we can eat fish. Fish has now become unaffordable to the average Gambian family. So how can somebody who ignored a transition uh, agreement in Adama Barrow be sent to go and talk to another leader about transition. How can ECOWAS that encourage the coup in Gambia, the coup in Guinea, the coup in Guinea-Bissau, the coup in Mali, the coup in Burkina Faso? Yes, because ECOWAS is a French institution. It's supposed to be there for the West Africans. ECOWAS is supposed to be fighting the interests of West African people. ECOWAS is there for the French because the biggest French puppets in Africa are in the ECOWAS region. Macky Sall of Senegal and Alassane Ouattara of Guinea Africos are the biggest French puppets in West Africa. And now mercenary sent by the foreign powers because they're coming back to Africa again. Resources, resources are becoming scarce. So the West is coming to Africa again to take hold of our resources. That's what they're doing. So what do they do? They send mercenaries to attack our institutions and governments and say, oh, jihadists have come. They're attacking Ghana now. 
Britain has given Ghana 70 armored vehicles to fight who? What did Britain know that we didn't know? Togo and Benin are getting occasional terrorist attacks. Are they terrorists? No. These are mercenaries who've been sent to West African ter territories. Congo, Central African Republic, Mozambique. They only go where there are resources. They want to come back again. Colonialism 2.0. They want to take control of us. They want to create a situation of fear so that we can be helpless and we can say, oh, France, oh, Britain, oh, United States, come and help us. And with that will be colonialism again on African soil and ECOWAS is helping them. This is what annoys me. How can you pick somebody like Adam Abaro who ignored his transition agreement to go and advise somebody about keeping to transition agreements. I mean, what, what, what goes on in these people's heads? Set an example. Be an exemplary leader. Be someone who admitted defeat or somebody who said to his people, after two years, I'm going to leave power or at least, yeah, after three years, I'm going to leave and organize an election. Or after two years, I'll organize an election in which I can contest. But Adam Abaro told Gambian people, his coalition partners, yes, I agreed to the three-year transition, and after three years, I'm not going to contest. That's their memorandum of understanding. Adam Barrow was not supposed to contest a second term. He could come back after 2021. So in 2024, 2025, he would have had some respect. People would have said, oh, this guy stuck to his three-year transition agreement. He didn't contest in the immediate election after his resignation. So now he's coming back again. He's got a little bit of credibility. Apart from the corruption, at least he keeps his word. No. Since October or November 2020, 2017, sorry, barely 11 months into office, Adam Abaro was already plotting his second term. And he knew he was not going to comply with the memorandum of understanding that he struck between his coalition partners. He was going to renege on his promise. He was going to face Gambian people, West African people, African people, the whole globe and lie to them, and ECOWAS can do nothing about it. The same ECOWAS is causing problems and wars in Africa because ECOWAS went to Gambia and struck an agreement between Gambia's former president, President Jame, President Yaya Jame. ECOWAS went and negotiated the deal between Adam Abaro President Jame, ECOWAS itself, and the African Union and the United Nations. The agreement is still on UN's website, United Nations website. You go and look at it. ECOWAS struck the deal between themselves, President Jame, President Barrow, the African Union, and UN. The agreement was that President Jame could leave Gambia and come back at a time of his choosing, and President Jame would not be persecuted, his properties will not be confiscated, the amount of abuse his family suffered and President Jami himself, the verbal and legal abuse, was not going to happen. That's the agreement ECOWAS struck between them, Adam Abaro, President Jami, African Union and UN. What did Adam Abaro do? Break all those premises and ECOWAS kept quiet. Why isn't ECOWAS coming out publicly and saying, Adam Abaro, you agreed something with President Jami. You agreed something with us. You agreed something with AU and the UN. Therefore, we want you to openly put things in place for President Jame to come back to the Gambia. Because if you don't do that, next time there's a push and pull, there's a kerfuffle between two parties, there's going to be civil war because people are not going to trust us. Nobody's going to trust a deal struck by ECOWAS and an institution. If I was in the Gambia now and I lost an election and I appealed to the Supreme Court, I'm not going to trust ECOWAS to come and negotiate on my behalf or on behalf of us. I'm not going to think ECOWAS is going to be able to enforce the agreement between me and the other party. So I'm going to stay my ground. I'm going to hold out for better. And that would mean civil war because ECOWAS is going to send in a useless army like ECOMIC who are in Gambia but cannot tackle crime rates. They're going to send their forces to come to Gambia to try and remove me, but they can't because ECOWAS never won a war. And what's going to happen? We're going to have several wars in West Africa. The ECOWAS Commission, the Commission President, useless. Both of them. The other one has passed away. ECOWAS is doing nothing about the agreement between Barrow and President Jam. ECOWAS is doing nothing about constitutional pro processes in West Africa. 
All they do is condemn. Oh, we're going to sanction the Guinea, Guinea junta. Oh, we're going to sanction the Mali junta. Niger is there, overthrow. Chad is there, overthrow. All of these, the common denominator is France. Whatever France tells Africa and whatever France tells Senegal, that's what happens in West Africa. France told them they're not going to allow the uh, French francs to disappear because West Africa was supposed to have our own currency called the eco way back in 2018. They postponed it. 2019 postponed it. 2020 they said they're going to put it on the back burner. They're going to shelve it. Why? Because France wanted the eco to be pegged to the euro, French banks for foreign exchange. So now France is making 500 billion to 800 billion euros from its former colonies in Africa. If West Africa had the eco, Africa coast, coast, which is a major foreign exchange uh, entity for France, and Senegal, which is a major foreign exchange entity for France, France is going to lose the billions of euros they were getting from those two countries. You add Benin to her, you add Togo to that, you add uh, uh, Mali and Burkina Faso to that, and Mauritania, and France is doomed. So therefore, France will go and overthrow or cause some serious problems in West Africa if Senegal and Africa agree. Those are their major countries in West Africa, Senegal and Africa. And they have their biggest puppets in those countries. Watara and Makisal. Now the eco, the West African currency is dead. After all the intellectual property that was put into developing it, the economic property that was put into developing it, the, the effort that was put by West African governments to roll out the eco, and Mohamed Buhari, who's good friends with the French, they said, oh, we have to put the eco on the back burner because if we roll it out, it will affect the Nigerian currency and Nigeria is the superpower economy in West Africa or the whole of Africa. How is it going to affect it? The euro didn't affect the German economy. Germany is the superpower of the euro. It's the biggest economy in the eurozone. Germany is the wealthiest economy in the eurozone. It didn't affect Germany. But when the French get into their ears, Buhari is gone, dead. That man lost his head years ago anyway. He's not the same. They come and they came and tell told them, oh, you cannot roll out the eco because it's gonna affect your huge Nigerian economy. Germany wasn't affected. Germany was a superpower. France was not affected. Super, so France is a superpower in Europe. Italy wasn't affected. Italy was a superpower in Europe. Why would Africa, Afri Coast, Nigeria, and Senegal say that, oh, no, we're not going to roll out the eco because if we roll out, it's going to affect our economies? Because France wanted us to peg it to their banks so that they can continue to get the 500 euro, half 500 billion to 800 billion euro they're getting from their former colonies for free. Now, that's just their former colonies. If they're getting 500 billion euros to 800 billion euros a year from their former colonies, Imagine how much the United States is getting from Africa. How much is the United Kingdom getting from Africa? How much is Italy getting from Africa? How much is Germany getting from Africa? You put that together, the imperialists... The Why is my internet buffering? Sorry about it. Why would we want the West African currency to be pegged, uh, pegged to the uh, French euro, French banks, for guarantee? Why can't we have our own West African Central Bank? Nigeria can do it. All we have to do is every country contributes to the central bank. We'll have a reserve. And then we can borrow and lend and borrow from that. Eventually, the profits that the central bank makes from their operations, we can have our own currency pegged to that. We can have our own guarantees. We can have our own foreign exchange. Why do we think we have to rely on Western powers every single time, my brothers? Why? Francis come and say, whispered in Makisal's ear, don't allow it. In Watara's ear, don't allow it. In Buhari's ear, don't allow it. And there are allegations between links, in links between France and Boko Haram and Mohamed Buhari. I don't know what's going on. Those are allegations. I want to leave them aside because that's one conflict where I cannot get clear information. And I don't want to lie to people or mislead people. But it's very suspicious 
what's going on in Nigeria, the emergence of Boko Haram and the rise of Mohamed Buhari to power. Very suspicious. Oh, they picked Adam Abaro to go and talk to Asimi Goita to talk to him about the transition period. Asimi Goita is making us all proud African citizens. He kicked the French out completely, clean. The same thing that the amoeba of Burkina Faso was supposed to do. Kick the French out clean. Eventually, we'll remove all the French forces from West Africa and our conflicts will be over. No, Damiba decided he was going to come into power and then he started bringing French forces to guard him. He started sleeping with Macron and France. He started betraying the ideals of the revolution in Burkina Faso. Only Goita and the Guinea guy are holding on to their ideals so far after overthrowing governments. Dumbuya. Damiba came and disappointed every single person. The Western mercenaries started attacking seriously, attacking Burkina Bays and killing them mercilessly. He got overthrown yesterday by the same captain who helped him overthrow Roach. Roach Kabore. This is the problem we're at. Damiba came in to overthrow the French puppet for being a French puppet. And then Damiba himself became a French puppet. So the people who helped him overthrow the French puppet for being a French puppet overthrew him for being a French puppet. Only uh, the, uh, Goita is holding on strong. Kicked French out. The French are clean. That's what Modibo Keita did. They overthrew him and assassinated. They killed him. That's what Sekuture did. They tried every single thing to overthrow Sekuture of Guinea. They couldn't. Allegations were, when they finally knew Sekuture wants to cut the shackles of slavery completely, they tried to assassinate him or overthrow him, they couldn't. So what did they do? They went and poured concrete in the water system, sewerage system in Conakry, in Guinea. The capital city of Guinea is Conakry. Same thing they did to Patrice Lumumba. When they knew he was going to cut the ties completely with France, does he want to be in the uh, uh, safer zone? They assassinated him. And several other African presidents who got overthrown, Krumah and others, as soon as they know you're on the path to liberate Africa and to develop your country, you're gone. We know that now. We're educating African citizens. We're beginning to know what's going on. So now, we all know, most of us know, the African youth know, the awakening of African youth is refreshing, especially since this war in Ukraine. We have seen the love they have for their fellow Blue eyes, green eyes, blonde hair, brunette hair, brothers and sisters. We've seen how much love they have for Ukraine. Africa has got 14 live wars, maybe 15. And I'll count them. Southern Senegal has got war. Kasamas, we call that region of Southern Senegal. Mali has got war going on. Burkina Faso has got war going on. Chad and Rizé have the same. Libya have the same. Nigeria has the same. We have Democratic Republic of Congo. We have Central African Republic. We have Somalia. We have South Sudan. We have Cameroon. We have Mozambique. War going on in all those countries. Ethiopia and uh, Tigray region. About 14 or 15 regions at war. I'm not going to add Western Sahara and Morocco because that's uh, colonialism. One wants to go separate. The other one is there. So it's not like... That's a civil war in the country. If you add that there, then we've got 15, 16 conflicts in Africa. The Western Sahara one with Morocco. Western Sahara wants to go independent. Morocco is refusing to give them their independence. If we add that to it, we have 15, 16 conflicts in Africa. Majority of them waged by foreign powers. And majority of them in areas where we have huge natural resources. Uganda is their next target. I posted this on my wall a few months ago when Uganda mistakenly published that they had a huge find of gold reserves. I posted it jokingly and I said, very soon there will be terrorists in Uganda or there will be an epidemic in Uganda. And then somebody created a meme with a vulture. Oh, Uganda's got terrorists. Let's go and help them. And who went there? CIA, France, UK, NATO. Somebody made that meme jokingly. 
But that's what we have today. The EU has blocked the pipeline that Uganda wanted to run to Tanzania. And another country, is it Zambia or is it Kenya? The EU has blocked it. They said, oh, environmental concerns. The same EU that's bringing back the coal mines and coal factories and all power plants that pollute the environment. Yes, EU has forgotten their green agenda. But they're blocking Uganda's advancement, Tanzania's advancement, and Kenya or Zambia, I can't remember which way the pipeline was running. Or was it Rwanda? They're blocking that project. Oh, because they're going to go through virgin forest to be able to run that pipeline. But Russia is running the pipelines at NC to Germany. And there are some pipelines running through Ukrainian land from Russia to Germany to other countries in Europe. That's not an environmental threat. They wanted to use the green agenda, the climate change agenda, to stop us from developing. That's failed now. We've seen their colors. We've seen what the Europeans are all about. Brothers and sisters, we need to wake up, man. We really, really need to wake up as African people. All these jihadists you're seeing in Africa, they're not jihadists. Africa hasn't got religious conflict. The killing of Nigerians by the Fulanis and other people. Who's sponsoring the Fulanis in Nigeria? They want Nigeria to have religious or ethnic tension so we can go back to Biafra. We fight between ourselves, kill each other, and then in that period, they'll still continue to siphon the oil from Nigeria or the reserves from Nigeria or other things. Mozambique never had religious war. Where did the jihadists suddenly come from? Jihadists with blue eyes, green eyes, blonde hair, brunette hair, drape themselves like Arabs to make it look like, oh, they're genuine jihadists. And now, who went there to offer some help? France and Rwanda. Paul Kagame needs to cut the French. There are serious allegations against that man that he's getting involved with the French everywhere. He's keeping our own brothers at war so he can benefit from it with his masters. To develop his own Rwanda. Fine. We want Rwanda to develop. But not at the expense of our own brothers and sisters in Congo, Central African Republic, Mozambique and other places. Which other place is Rwanda planning to go and deploy their army again? Was it Burkina Faso or Niger or Chad? I saw it published. I can't remember. Who is Rwanda army going there with? The French. The relationship between Buhari, Paul Kagame and the French has to be investigated. Everywhere the French went to keep mission, not everywhere, a few places where they went peacekeeping mission, Rwanda is there. Their cooperation, the understanding between Rwandan forces and the French forces, is a concern. I'm not accusing Paul Kagame of what people are accusing him of, of looting Congo with the help of his masters and developing his country with that. Museveni has been accused of the same. Now there's Ebola in Uganda and it's killing people. Straight after they published, a few months after Uganda published that they found huge gold reserves, Ebola came to Uganda. It's killing Ugandan people. Ebola kills people in Democratic Congo. What's in Congo? Huge gold reserves and diamond and all the other minerals you can think of on planet Earth. Oh, Sierra Leone has got Ebola. What's in Sierra Leone? Gold, diamond and other resources on planet Earth. Mozambique, they just found huge reserves of gas and oil. Straight away, they are jihadists. If Gambia discovers gold and uh, oil or gas, and we refuse to give them oil at 5%, like Senegal and Guinea-Bissau are doing, we'll have terrorists in Gambia, jihadists who suddenly show up in the Gambia. Who will be the first to offer to go and fight jihadists in the Gambia? France and Rwanda, maybe. This is the game they've played on us. They create a problem that doesn't exist. They create enmity between us. They divide us. They brainwash our people. And we believe that we cannot survive without them. The Democratic Republic Congo president and Paul Kagame had to go and get validation from Macron. They need a white person to stand between them to be able to get them to listen to each other and stop the war in Congo. Because they will not listen to their fellow black people. If I went today to Paul Kagame and I said, those M23 rebels send the Ugandan forces, Rwandan forces to kick them out, 
and I said to Museveni, send your Ru uh, Ugandan forces to go and kick them out. They'll not listen to me. Stop fighting between yourself. They don't listen to me. They want a white person to come and validate their in stupidity. Without the white color, skin color, they will not believe. They will not listen to anyone. Macron had to come and talk peace between Rwanda and Democratic Republic of Congo. When it's clear that M23 rebels go in and out of Rwanda, Rwandan forces can easily nab them, shut the border, make sure those M23 rebels are annihilated or disarmed completely. No, that's too easy, isn't it? It's African and African. Kagame's masters will not be happy with that. The other masters, the many rebels in Congo who've been, who are being sponsored, financed, funded by foreign powers, they're not going to be happy with that. But that is the right thing to do, Africa. We need to kick these people out. These rebels are not there because they are fighting a cause to change the poor governance like the one we have in Gambia. No. They're in there to make sure our land is lawless in areas where there's gold and diamond and oil and gas. They want to make those areas lawless so that their masters can come in the cover of dark. Sometimes in broad daylight, because I hear allegations, there's tarmac inside the Congo jungle built by the imperial powers where they fly their private jets in and out to pick up the gold, diamond and other things and fly out in the Democratic Republic of Congo. That's what's going on. In the Republic of the Gambia, in the Republic of Senegal, in the Republic of Ivory Coast, in the Republic of Nigeria, in the Republic of... They're not putting 10% on their medical care, 10% of their budget on medical care. Gambia doesn't have a 1 billion euro medical budget for the year. Senegal probably doesn't have a 1 billion euro medical budget. Africa probably doesn't have 10 billion euro medical budget. But we have 400, 500, 800 billion euros every year to give to France for free. When our citizens get sick, they have to fly to France or England or United States to go and get treated or India. We cannot treat them on our own soil because we are busy giving France 500 billion, 400 billion euros every year. But none of those French colonies has got a 10 billion euro budget for their health services every year. What is wrong with us? Are we mentally deficient? Have we got problems as a black race or as an African race? Because the black Americans don't behave like black Africans. They're not enslaved. The black British don't behave like that. The Caribbeans have overcome it. The Asians have overcome it. Look at how quick Vietnam, Cambodia, yeah? All those places, look at how they're developing quickly. Thailand, Laos, you name them. Philippines. Look at how quickly they're developing. Malaysia, which was developing at the same rate as Ghana before they overthrew Nkrumah because they cannot allow that development to take place in Africa. They can allow Malaysia to develop like that. They can allow Singapore to develop like that. They can allow Indonesia to develop like that. But they cannot allow Ghana to develop at the same rate. And Ghanaian President Nkrumah and the Malaysian Amir or President at the time went to the same university, Oxford or similar. They promised each other while they were at university that they will do barter trade. They will exchange expertise or materials or whatever they have to exchange so they can develop at the same rate. When they saw that in Ghana, they thought, no, we cannot allow Nkrumah to continue to develop Ghana at this rate. We need to kick him out. Same thing they did with 22, 23 other people. Do you think John Maga fully died of natural causes? <laughs> Look, I, one day, yes, we are powerless to fight these people, foreign armies, they're too powerful. But we don't have to fight. We can just hold our cards to ourselves. Barter trade between us. By now, West Africans should be going to each other's countries on holidays or weekends, beach parties, road trips. They would have had super highways, freeways. You should be able to travel from Mauritania all the way to Nigeria in a few days. Travel back. You can go to Sierra Leone Beach for next weekend. Sierra Leoneans can go to Nigerian Beach the next weekend. Nigerians can come to Gambian Beach. We've got beautiful beaches in the Gambia. Adama Baru has allowed the Chinese to kill them. Round about Gunjur and... Our tourism industry is dead. Tourism industry used to employ about 42,000 people in the Gambia. Now, 
all those jobs pretty much have disappeared. The World Bank or whichever bank, IMF gave Gambia 65 million euros or dollars to diversify tourism. You know where that money is going to go? It's going to go into one of the ministers building estates in Senegal. But anyway, I've been on this Facebook Live too long, brothers and sisters. I didn't want to go on forever. There's a lot to talk about. Next time I come here, it will be a Pan-African talk because there's a lot happening in Africa right now that no one can finish talking about. Adma Barrow's projects are all failing in the Gambia. I'll come back again. There's so much to talk about. It'll take a week or two or three to talk about, to, con uh, to cover these topics adequately. So all I can do right now is touch bits and bobs here and there. What's happening in the Gambia now is a leadership crisis. We don't have a leader. We don't have a president. He can't even pronounce the simplest of words. He can't articulate himself. He doesn't talk to Gambian people about the problems they're facing on a daily basis. He doesn't tell them what his government is doing to be able to uh, ameliorate the situation that Gambia is in. The nation is collapsing. Crime rates, drug rates, the murders. People are getting away with crime. Government departments and government officials are getting away with open corruption, fraud, with impunity. Nothing is going to come out of it. You watch the drugs found of two, three days ago. Nothing is going to come out of it. In fact, the people who are supposed to be enforcing the law might end up being the pushers of that, those drugs that they seized. Because that's what's happening. The drugs have gone missing from our law courts. Allegations of uh, quantities of drugs getting missing at the Drug Law Enforcement Agency, Gambia. Many people who were arrested with tons of drugs before cocaine. They didn't get caught. They didn't get prosecuted. They went free. Do you think the Gambia government is involved in it? Why else would the Gambia government not be punishing people who are caught red-handed with drugs? Why do you think they're not prosecuting? You tell me the answer next time I come live. Thank you very much for tuning in. I appreciate you all. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you.